Hey Pokemon fans, Almighty Arceus here with part two of my Secrets of Galar theory series. In part one of this series, link down below for the video so you can watch it before you watch this one, I talked about how Eternatus is the literal physical embodiment of the energy that binds space-time in the Pokemon multiverse, also known as Infinity Energy. It also came to be as one of Arceus's 1,000 arms that shaped the beginnings of the Pokemon universe, way back when. After I released this theory, I had a lot of great comments and I found out that some great minds think alike. In fact, I invited one of those great minds that had the exact same theory as me to come and collaborate with me on part two of this theory. Hey, almighty Arceus, Pokemon Masters, Berkey Batobi here. And yeah, Arceus, you and I agree perfectly about uh, Eternatus and its probable relationship to the original one, Arceus, and how Gigantamax energy and Infinity energy are the same thing. There is definitely more to Eternatus here than what meets the eye at first glance. When you first play the game, there's definitely some more hidden information under there. And so I guess the best thing to do would be to look back at the history of Gala and how Eternatus ties into it. Eternatus is known in Galar as the Pokemon responsible for causing the darkest day, and is also responsible for giving the energy that people need in order to Dynamax and Gigantamax their Pokemon, known as Galar Particles. And as I was saying before, Galar Particles are the same thing as Infinity Energy. But trainers, this is just the tip of the iceberg. When you start to investigate Eternatus' history, we find that he's not just linked to the darkest day in Galar, but perhaps the darkest day in Pokemon history. And we're here to investigate. And yeah, the darkest day is huge in the history of Pokemon. In fact, the date 3,000 years ago has been referenced in a number of different bits of Pokemon lore, in not just the relic items from Unova, but also in Mel Metal's Pokedex entry, which is something we've actually talked about over on my channel, but you have to check that video out after this one. With that being said, let's, let's get, get started. started. So let's start with talking about Eternatus' history on Earth. We'll start actually at the very beginning before it even came to Earth. So at some point, Arceus used these 1,000 arms to bind space-time together and create the actual fabric of reality in the Pokemon universe. And then through some means, probably just from being exhausted or being used, those arms were flung across the universe. And one of those arms just happened to crash land 20,000 years ago onto the surface of Earth in the Galar region. Eternatus crashed to Earth 20,000 years ago in a meteor, caused massive destruction across the region, likely ignited the original darkest day before the darkest day even happened, a prehistoric darkest day, and then went into hibernation. Now, this origin is actually inspired from the Godzilla universe and from kaijus. There are a number of kaijus that have existed throughout the Godzilla canon that fell from space in some sort of meteor and then were hibernating for a long time and then came out and faced off against the big green Godzilla himself. One of the most notable foes being King Ghidorah, which notably has three heads and two tails for a total of five different digits in addition to its wings that it could fling around. So it's kind of similar to that Hand of Eternatus when you think about it. There's also Space Godzilla. I know, very creative names, right? And there's also the Energy Monster, which was in the animated series of Godzilla, which actually looks a lot like the spiral form of Eternatus in that it's kind of like this big bug that shoots out energy beams and can also absorb electrical energy as well. So there's a lot of kaiju inspiration. We already knew that Dynamax and Gigantamax were inspired by the kaijus and the Godzilla series, but this is actually some direct connections as to how Eternatus came to Earth in the first place. Now, similar to many kaijus, as well as similar to many Pokemon in the Pokemon universe, like Kyogre and Groudon, after crashing to Earth, it went into some sort of hibernating state. It was probably drained of all of its energy. That's why you have all of this energy now that's ambient throughout the Galar region coming through the dens and the natural rock formations within the wild area. And so most of his original energy was distributed throughout the region and that's where you have Galar particles floating around. It's likely those particles were separated from Eternatus when it first crashed to Earth. And it became this drained skeletal form and that's the form that you're actually able to use in battle in the game. So we're assuming it's kind of its depowered form. Very similar to how Necrozma was depowered in Sun and Moon and then got its Ultra Necrozma form in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon as well. So it's very similar to that kind of idea. 
also similar to Kyogre and Groudon, in order to reactivate or reawaken Eternatus, there needs to be some sort of activation energy. With Kyogre and Groudon, it was the red and blue orb, respectively. For Eternatus, it seems like Rose is doing some sort of meddling in order to make that happen. And it would be on this day 20,000 years ago that Claydol would be created. In Pokemon Sword and Shield, they add a new Pokedex entry for Claydol, talking about how it was made, it came to life. 20,000 years ago, and to me it makes no sense that they would put that Pokedex entry there in the generation that brings in Eternatus in the very same games where it claims that 20,000 years ago Eternatus came down to the Pokemon world. There's no reason to put that data there unless there's a relationship. And this might well extend to other Golem Pokemon. There are plenty of them in Gala. For example, we see Golurk in the Gala region. We see Sigilyph, which is kind of based off of an ancient hieroglyph. It's a very odd Pokemon, but it's, it generally revolves around ancient society. There's the Runic Pokemon in Galarian Yamask and Runarigus. And of course, Gala's very own Stonjourner, which has Pokedex entries kind of hinting towards a mystery behind it as well. The Pokemon world is an odd place, and for the people living there 20,000 years ago, they would be accustomed to the various magical creatures and stuff, but even for them, seeing golems come to life, that's something worth documenting and heralding, and that's why you see these stones all around Turfield. Sculpted runes that are very clearly references to Stonjourna, the ancient Claydol statues in Stone Side, the giant Henge of Toxtricity, the Gigantamax form, or the giant Dogdrio statue, these events left an impact on people that has, is at the core of this region. So then, Eternatus just kind of slept for 17,000 years or so, until about 3,000 years ago. That's the date that Sonya gives you when you look at the geoglyph at Turfield. You see this giant, what looks like a Gigantamax Toxtricity on the side of the hill, and she talks about how this Gigantamaxing Pokemon mural was made about 3,000 years ago. So we're able to trace back the fact that the darkest day likely happened about 3,000 years ago, and that date is going to be critically important to this theory, so hang on to that. We don't exactly know how Eternatus was revived 3,000 years ago, and that's something we'll also explore a little bit later, but we do know that when it did happen, Eternatus rose up out of the ground in its Eternamax form and initiated the Darkest Day, very similar to what happens in the actual plot of Sword and Shield. So we can assume that it became very gigantic, it absorbed all of the ambient Galar energy, the infinity energy within the Galar region, and started Dynamaxing and Gigantamaxing Pokemon all over the place. In order to stop them, the two kings, or truly what we actually know is the two Pokemon, Zacian and Zamazenta, came to the rescue and defeated Eternatus using their Behemoth Blade and Behemoth Bash. And there was some sort of grand battle that happened 3,000 years ago that prevented Eternatus from wreaking more havoc across the region. We also know that after the travesty of the Darkest Day, that Zacian and Zamazenta went to go and heal their wounds in the hero's bath, supposedly along with the two heroes, though. We still have to figure out who exactly those are. That might be something we'll have to think about for a later theory. In Pokemon Sword and Shield, in modern day, we meet Chairman Rose, and at this point in the time, Chairman Rose is already a powerhouse. And I've done a theory talking about exactly why he is as powerful as he is, and the gist of it is this. We know from talking to Eliana at the end of the game that he used to be part of Gala's work workforce. He used to be an underground miner, a digger, and this is kind of referenced in the fact that his ace Pokemon is Copperaja, and we see one of the miners of Gala with a Kufan in, uh, in Hillbury. But Chairman Rose was never any old miner. I think he was leading an expedition. I think he knew exactly what he was trying to dig up and unearth underneath Hammerlock as well as these power spots underneath where all of the modern day stadiums are built today. It's not like the stadiums were built and then they discovered the power spots were there. No, it's the other way around. The stadiums were built where the power spots are by Chairman Rose because of his discovery of the dormant Eternatus underneath Hammerlock Castle. He built those stadiums above those power spots and he used the energy of the dormant Eternatus to power the region. And this is what gave him the money to kind of fund this big Pokemon League. And he knew where to look because a certain someone who looks an awful lot like him, a brother, a father, a cousin, a relative of some sort who is gonna appear in the Crown Tundra DLC is the guide who's gonna lead you through that DLC. 
the very same DLC where we're actually going to go underground and see inside raid dens and find a legendary Pokemon. I'm sure Chairman Rose knew exactly what he was looking for. But of course, as we all know from actually playing Pokemon Sword and Shield, Chairman Rose, he decided that taking the energy of a dormant Eternatus, that wasn't enough. He had to make sure that the region was going to have enough, enough energy for the whole future. So given all of this information, we have a few important facts to keep track of. First, Eternatus was hibernating after crashing to Earth 20,000 years ago, until about 3,000 years ago as reported by Sonya when it initiated the darkest day. We know also that Rose utilized some sort of energy-infusing device to absorb the ambient Galar particles and Galar energy, the infinity energy in the Galar region, and re-energized Eternatus, creating the Eternamax Eternatus form. That's why that happened in the first place. That's why it had that weird little orb. It was absorbing all of this energy and being absorbed. And then it became its giant's form once again. So what that means is we know that Eternatus needs some sort of activation energy in order to become Eternamax Eternatus once again. Once it gets that influx of activation energy, it'll absorb the ambient energy that once was a part of it in its original Eternamax Eternatus form. Now, eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed the significance of the 3,000 years ago date. Not only does that date come up within this series of events of the Darkest Day in Galar, but it was also critical to the history of what was happening 3,000 years ago in Kalos, the Kalos region. Yes, I am referring specifically to the ancient Pokemon war that AZ participated in, fought in, and used the ultimate weapon in. You can probably see where I'm going with this. I believe that the Darkest Day in Galar was caused not just out of random events, but because they were engaged in war with the Kalos region, and because the ultimate weapon was fired at where Eternatus is in the Galar region. So let's break this down. We know how the story of AZ goes, right? So he is really heartbroken that his partner Floette passed away, and he tries to revive Floette with this magical machine that he built that can imbue life by using the life force of other Pokemon. But then he revives this Pokemon Floet. And so because of that, AZ gets mad and creates the ultimate weapon out of what once was a life-giving device, shoots a giant beam of infinite energy up into the sky, and hits the ground, effectively ending the war that AZ was fighting. Now, the big question we've always had is who they were fighting this war against. Some people thought it was within Kalos, some sort of regional squabble of some sort, but we know that AZ was fighting against some other kingdom and that there were many great travesties during that time. Well, given the fact that these events seem to be happening in historical parallel, I suspect that AZ and the nation or whatever it was at the time, the kingdom of Kalos, 3,000 years ago, was fighting whatever the kingdom of Galar was 3,000 years ago, and they were having a great ancient Pokemon War. Yes, these are the answers you've been waiting for since Generation 6. So interestingly enough, I was working on this video about how Infinity Energy and Gigantamax Energy are the same thing, and that Eternatus is related to Arceus, and Almighty Arceus had the same idea, great minds think alike. That is of course part one of this series of videos, and we both came to the same conclusion, the same ideas. Arceus has a Pokedex entry talking about how it has a thousand arms that it used to help shape the universe, and the Eternamax form of Eternatus is a giant hand on the end of a giant arm. A hand that can walk space and time, you see this around it in the battle. It is the source of all Gigantamax energy in the region, and we know that Arceus helped create the universe using infinity energy. In the Canon Live Library, it talks about how the universe began with an egg containing the original one, an original spirit. And by the game's Pokemon X and Y, we learned that this original spirit is really called infinity energy, and that is the life force of all Pokemon. And it's the same stuff as Gigantamax energy. In a kind of mini theory kind of way, that's represented in the way that uh, Raid Dens beam a giant red light into the sky. And it's the same red light that we see coming out of Pokeballs when a Pokemon is sent out. It's the manipulation of that infinity energy. And of course, infinity energy is used in the production of Pokeballs, and we know this because the Devon Corporation uses infinity energy in their Pokemon products. These energies, these forces in Pokemon, they all sound similar because they are the same things, different tellings of the same force. Wielded by Arceus and it's a thousand arms at the beginning of the universe, and of course is a core part of Eternatus's being. 
So AZ fires the ultimate weapon, and as we know, the ultimate weapon utilizes infinity energy. This was canonized in the Generation 6 games, both in X and Y, and further explored in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. Those games showed that infinity energy could be used to warp space and time, and was also the energy that was absorbed from the life force of Pokemon to create the destructive power that was the ultimate weapon. Now, AZ fired the ultimate weapon, shot that infinity energy up into space, and it shot right back down into the Galar region. Now, as we covered in part one, we know that infinity energy is the same energy that Eternatus is made up out of, that it functions on. So, with this raw infinity energy beam hitting the region, not only is that going to cause massive destruction as is depicted, but it also created the activation energy needed to reawaken Eternatus and reignite its darkest day Eternamax form. And it is this energy, this activation energy shot from the ultimate weapon into Galar that actually caused the darkest day to take place. That's the reason it took place 3,000 years ago. Eternatus was reactivated by the firing of the ultimate weapon. It became its Eternamax form once again, and then launching into what we know in Galar as the darkest day. So truly, this wasn't just the darkest day in Galar. This was the darkest day in Pokemon history. AZ lost his beloved companion, might have won the war, but at what cost? And Galar was definitely decimated at that point. I'm sure massive populations of people in Pokemon were wiped off the map because of that massive blast and then subsequent Darkest Day initiation of Eternatus. Now, we may have answered a bunch of questions in this one and created some deeper connections here, but what we don't really know yet is how Zamazenta and Zacian really factor into all this. What's, what's the whole point of them? What's their history? The game literally keeps it as vague as possible. It confuses you with all these different plot threads and never answers any questions. Well, I won't stand for that, and I'm going to answer that in part three. So make sure you're sticking with the Secrets of Galar theory series, and I hope I'll see you next time. I want to thank Birdkeeper Toby for helping me out on part two. It was really cool that we ended up coming up with such similar theories, and I'm excited to work with you on some other stuff. And of course, Arceus, thank you so much for having me, but I don't think we're done yet. This is to say, as well as there being future parts to this very series, there's also another video over on my channel talking about how exactly Gigantamax Melmetal fits into the whole picture. That Pokemon is very regionless. It really does need a, a home somewhere in Pokemon lore. Anyway, thank you for having me. I'm Almighty Arceus. Thanks so much for watching.